the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. If you enjoy this podcast, you should check out our newsletter, an often irreverent take on recent Court of Appeals opinions, which we publish every Friday. And please check out our sister podcast, the documentary series Bound by Oath. This week, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to some new listeners we might have. Those would be various law students I met across the country this fall. I've spoken to six law schools in the past six weeks or so, uh, five of those being in person. So thanks to those of you I've met who came to hear about things like unenumerated rights, judicial engagement, and Supreme Court trivia. And if you're a law student who hasn't had me come to campus but wants to subject your colleagues to my presence, please feel free to reach out to us at IJ. And although law school guest speakers are entertaining, I hope you'll be even more entertained by what we have today. Because joining me is one of the most entertaining uh, lawyers around, who's also available to speak at your campus, Rob Johnson of at IJ. Rob, how are you doing these days? Well, you know, I was doing really well. And then you told me that you asked like 30 people to be on the podcast. And I was your your bottom of the barrel choice. So <laughs> that, it's that's nice right. to say I'm entertaining. I appreciate it. Everyone else at, at IJ and when, when, even, um, when even Dana Berliner turned me down, I, I turned to you. No, that's a lie, actually. I, I, I didn't invite Dana, but we will have her on uh, at some point. Um, so this is going to be a more, if you haven't noticed already, this is going to be a bit of a more laid back episode than normal, because uh, it's just me and Rob here today, um, which means I'll be presenting a case for once. I haven't done in a very long time. My case is a good example of bad facts making bad law. It's a doozy involving a family night out that turns south an inebriated dad who can't remember what he told the cops, and Section 1983 continuing its narrowing march. But my case has nothing on Rob's case, which discusses some of the most interesting fan fiction I've ever heard of. However, that means I should do something we don't normally do on short circuit, which is to warn anyone with younger children nearby, such as a parent listening in the car with kids, that there will be some adult subject matter and language in this episode. That's hard not to do, given both some of the facts in my case, um, but a huge amount of Rob's case, including the title of a book, which is Pride and Prejudice, the Wild and Wanton Edition. So Rob, now that they've heard that, listeners without kids in the car probably just want to cut to the juicy bits. So what's so wild and wanton? (laughs) I don't know if it's wanton. I think it's wanton. I mean, I don't wanton. know. Is that like okay? A, I, I I get my uh, food and a, my uh, emotions confused. I guess there we go. Um, yeah. So this is a case about porn in prisons, and uh, you know the the question is to what extent can a prison censor the books and reading materials that are available to the prisoners. And, you know, we bill it as, as porn in prison, but really it's none of this is pornography. Um, although some of it is quite, you know, steamy. The, the books that are at issue, there's, there's a, uh, a comic book called Pretty Face, which is a Japanese comic about a young man who is in a, a car accident, a dis, horribly disfigured. And the plastic surgeon who reconstructs his face gives him the same face as a woman who he's in love with. Um, sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, a a picture of a suntan advertisement, um, and then two books, one called Thrones of Desire, which is (laughs) an erotic parody of Game of Thrones, which to be honest, like having seen the, the HBO series, you sort of wonder like, how could they make it more erotic? But I guess they, they just basically cut out all the parts that aren't erotic and uh, went with that. Yeah, selections, it, it sounds more like in a, in a sense, maybe. Right, exactly. They cut out all the boring parts. and Yeah. Uh, and then Pride and Prejudice, the Wild and Wanton edition, which apparently is a book where they took Pride and Prejudice, the actual text, and then they just added to it. So, you know, you're reading Jane Austen, and it, the parts that are added are in a, di- a different font. So, like, you're reading Jane Austen in Times New Roman, 
And then suddenly you're reading in like, you know, sans serif font and like, it's like, you know, wild and wanton. So, mm -hmm. um, I hope it's the other in Jane Austen's diction though. I mean, I don't, I'm not probably going to go out and research that, but it, it would be neat if they kept, kept that, uh, that type of speech well, when the, they were describing these things. The Kindle edition is four ninety nine. So, you know, if you're curious. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we'll put a link up to that in the show notes, but people can find it if they want to. Uh, and then the last book was, it's a fine art book uh, entitled Matisse, Picasso, and Modern Art in Paris. Uh, and then the final thing, there were nine pictures um, of Renaissance artworks, including Michelangelo's David. And all of these things were, you know, censored by the prison. Uh, and this prisoner who is serving a life sentence for uh, murder uh, challenges the policy of censoring reading materials. And he says, you know, I have a First Amendment right to read these books. So um, the Eighth Circuit, well, the district court sort of halfway agrees with him. Uh, the district court says, some of this stuff is a little too steamy. Some of it's not. Um, you know, they say, pretty face, the, the comic book, it's too steamy. You can't get that. Uh, and they also say that the copper tone advertisement, um, too steamy. You can't have the sunscreen advertisement. But <laughs> that's a, a but, picture, a famous picture of the dog pulling the child's underwear, right? Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, I, I mean, I laugh, but actually maybe they... When it is a child. Images involving children. Right. If you have people in prison because of crimes against children and things like that, maybe there's some sort of, of a uh, sort of reason for that. Um, I don't know what was going on with the comic book. I, from, from what I've seen of it online, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But interestingly, um, the prisoner doesn't appeal. So he actually agrees, okay, fine. You, can, you don't have to give me those materials. Um, on the other hand, the district court does say the prison has to let him have uh, these two books, The Thrones of Desire and The Wild and, and Wanton, uh, Pride and Prejudice. And then uh, also they have to let him have the artwork. And then the, what the district court also does is sort of an interesting thing. They, they say, well, there's an overbreadth challenge. And we think this policy is overbroad, overbroad. And so the district court actually rewrites the policy and says, okay, we're going to basically excise parts of the policy that say that something can be... Um, withheld be just because it has nudity. And they also say that you can't withhold something just because it has graphic sexual content in it. It has to quote feature that, meaning it has to be something that it has like on a regular basis, as opposed to something that's more sporadic. Right. Um, it can't just be one page out of 300 or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the district court, you know, sort of interesting, um, interesting remedy, not what you typically would do if something's overbroad. You don't typically like rewrite it, but, um, you know, no one appeals the remedy either. The, ap the appeal is from the, is by the prison basically saying, you know, we think we should be entitled to censor anything. Um, and there's actually a line in the opinion that suggests the prison says they could even censor the Bible. Uh, because the you know, uh, the prisoner said, well, you know, I guess almost like a, to show how absurd this is, the prisoner said, oh, well, you know, the Bible has references to, you know, explicit passages like in Song of Solomon or, um, you know, other parts of the Bible. And, and so you could censor the Bible and the prison said, well, if we wanted to, sure, we could. We probably won't, but we could. Um, so it goes up to the Eighth Circuit. The prison is the only one appealing. And the Eighth Circuit says, um, well... Uh, we agree you can't censor this artwork. Um, you know, the, the book of modern art and the pictures. And they don't really say why, but they seem to just think it's just art and we're okay with censoring. We're, we're not okay with censoring art. Um, but then they say you can censor Thrones of Desire and the Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> and... You know, the, the explanation that they give is just, it's not particularly satisfying. I don't, I don't know if, you know, I mean, on the one hand, these are people who are in, in prison. And so the First Amendment interests here are somewhat reduced. Um, you know, obviously there are some materials like we were talking about with the copper tone advertisement 
maybe there's a reason you don't want that to be uh, sent to prison. But there's really no explanation of why these two books would be so problematic for a prisoner to have them. Uh, they just say, well, you know, prisons, This that if you let people who are in prison have sexually suggestive materials, that that might somehow interfere with their rehabilitation. What well, it seems that there are probably sex offenders somewhere in the prison. And it, it, and it seems like this guy, there's no, there's no allegation he is, but, and, but that once you get, once it, uh, something gets in the prison through the prison economy, which, you know, I'm sure pe people are familiar with in all kinds of ways, like drugs or whatever, that these materials will end up with kind of the, the person you least want to have it, like the sex offender, and that will hurt their rehabilitation. Yeah. And like I said, I do see that with like, for instance, the copper tone advertisement, right? Like, I mean, it, it's a little extreme, but I, I see it. Um, on the other hand, like, is the idea that if someone's a sex offender, like they're just, they're, they're somehow going to be shielded from ever thinking about sex. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, it just, it doesn't seem fully thought out. I, I don't really understand. Like, are we just sort of going to imagine that, all right, well, so this person's a sex offender, we'll put them in prison for you know, 10 years and, and we're going to somehow shield them from the idea of sex. Like there's going to be no references to sex in prison. And then they'll come out after 10 years of that and not be a sex offender anymore. And there, there's also no analysis like you'd expect in a first amendment case of how effective the policy is, because right, I'm right. sure there's stuff that gets it just like drugs. There's stuff that gets in the prison that's not allowed. So that person is going to see something because it's not a lot. So how effective is preventing this guy who you're who you're not you don't care about his sexual rehabilitation he's a murderer there for life whether it's going to eventually get to this other guy there's there's no facts at all right and there's just it's completely um i mean they, they actually reference this idea of common sense and they just say well common sense tells us that if prisoners have access to thrones of desire and you know the supplemented version of jane austen that 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 will somehow transform our wonderfully effective rehabilitative prison system into a, a den of iniquity it you know <laughs> I, I, maybe but there's really no explanation um and you know part of that i think lies in the standard right so we are in prison um and in in the prison the court tells us the the test is not the normal first amendment test it's instead whether the um the legislation or the restriction is rationally related to a legitimate penological interest, which, you know, sounds a lot like the rational basis test. And so, you know, I'm not sure that the restriction here satisfies even that hurdle, but that's a lot of what's going on here is that the government gets a lot more leeway in prison than it does outside of prison. Although one of the interesting things about that then is that it suggests that when it comes to economic liberty or areas where the rational basis test applies we all have exactly the same amount of rights as a prisoner does <laughs> that's a good point so um anyway poor mr sisney does not get his uh erotic novels he does get his art um and then there's an interesting uh, sort of other aspect to this because the the court had rewritten this the district court had rewritten this policy uh in light of its conclusion that it was overbroad and the Eighth Circuit just says um, that all of that is moot because uh, he, they basically say, well, you wouldn't get the novels even if we agreed that we should rewrite that, you know, even if we reviewed, uh, we're not, uh, gosh, it's, it's a part of the opinion that is so- It's incredibly confusing. Mind bending and confusing. I'm struggling even to articulate well, I think it's that you would have got the art, so there's no point in doing the overbreadth analysis because right. you get it anyway. Yes, right. And so then they say, like, they basically say it's moot, which is fascinating to me because this guy's still in prison. And so presumably he's going to order more stuff in the future. So, like, you know, I don't really understand in what way the controversy is moot, but. Uh, and there's a dissent who says, you know, this is definitely not moot. 
Um, on the other hand, the dissent doesn't think that the overbreadth challenge succeeds. They think the challenge should fail. But um, the Eighth Circuit doesn't even get there. And I think it is sort of, a, I guess, you know, a good example of how courts will use standing to um, essentially get out of having to decide questions. And they'll just, you know, the sort of all, constant impulse to duck hard questions or even easy questions just by invoking jurisdictional doctrines. And it's it's extraordinarily formalistic part of the opinion and hard to follow. But uh, there it is. Well, the the bizarre thing to me is they, well, there are many bizarre things about this overbreadth part of the opinion. But one is they said that one current part of the overbreadth was moot because Basically, yeah, because they, they he wouldn't get a remedy because he already has his remedy. But then they actually do address another part of the overbreadth, and they rule that I think it wasn't. Oh, yeah, they were it wasn't overbroad because there was no, there were no, there weren't enough examples of it to be overbroad. I think, and um, but the the part that that that's really weird is they say it's over. They say it's moot because you got your remedy anyway. But that still left this this ruling that it's overbroad in place, which of course affects the prison because it's an overbreadth ruling affects more people than just the, the person in the lawsuit. And then they say, and, and so the dissent says, yeah, but the prison wants to get rid of this overbreadth ruling. And um, and then the, the majority says, well, that doesn't matter because it only matters for a plaintiff, whether something's moot or not. And then in a footnote, which I think may be the most interesting part of opinion, footnote seven in the dissent, Judge Strauss says, if that were true, then a defendant could never appeal. Because, of course, if a plaintiff wins a lawsuit, say it blinks one claim, wins the lawsuit, that case is moot for the plaintiff. He's done. And yet the defendant, that meant the defendant could appeal, which, of course, is nonsensical. So, um you know, it, it, it so that the prison should be allowed to appeal this so it doesn't have to worry about this this um, policy anymore, um, which seems like it was, you know, more trouble than it was worth for the, the majority to try to get out of this issue by saying it was moot because it just starts to not make any sense. None of it makes sense. I mean, I, it seems like they just totally ignore the fact that this guy is still in prison anyway. So, like, presumably it's, like, not like he's never going to order another book, you know, it just it it doesn't really compute and then it is interesting too that this overbreath analysis is where you get the discussion of of the bible as well cuz the the majority basically seems to think like well if you couldn't because the prison says well you we could censor the bible uh and the majority basically seems to think well if you could censor the bible then this would be overbroad. <laughs> you just can't do that <laughs> but they say well we're just going to avoid that and we're going to say well you can't actually censor the bible but there are other works of, of literature, what are recognized as works of literature. They don't say what they are, but they say we recognize there are works of literature that are you know, widely acclaimed that would, could be censored under this policy. But we're OK with that. Uh, so it seems like if sort of reading between the lines of the majority opinion, the only book that you cannot censor is the Bible. <laughs> and the funny <laughs> thing is they give a couple examples that we don't need to get into. Uh, from the Bible that are, you know, kind of steamy. And I, uh, I'm i familiar with others that are even more steamy than those. So they don't really <laughs> do a full biblical analysis. Um, you know, that's we should true. Get a, we should get um, a biblical scholar on the show sometime to, to go into some of that. Um, so yeah. uh, I, I encourage uh, folks to check it out. There's also a discussion of abstention at one point. This, this is a case that really... Um, that really has everything. Uh, oh, and is that. It's a, a Pullman abstention foot. Yes, right. They, and no yeah. one raises it. They just say, well, no. we could go into Pullman abstention here, but no one raised it. And so I guess we uh, we don't need to. By the way, a little teaser for people. Uh, next week, we will be talking about this year being the 50th anniversary of the case Younger versus Harris, uh, which is um, uh, about younger abstention, funnily enough. Um, and that is a doctrine that plagues many civil rights lawyers. And so I think the episode will be coming out in a couple weeks. Uh, we'll have a special guest. And so um, you guys can can look forward to that. Uh, well, over in the Ninth Circuit, 
we have some other fun facts uh, that that uh, we'll be talking uh, about now involving very different kinds of things. There's no prisons. Uh, there's no pornography. Uh, but there is quite a lot of alcohol. So this guy um, is named Adrian Miranda, and he lives in Arizona. So it's kind of like Miranda versus Arizona, the, the famous case. But actually, it's not versus Arizona. It's Miranda versus city of Casa Grande in Arizona. Um, so he has a 14-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. And they go out bowling with their neighbors. Okay, that's great. Family having a good time together. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Miranda has too good of a time when he's at the bowling alley and um, has it seems something in the record saying he had six beers. And um, luckily, he recognizes he shouldn't drive. So his 17 year old son drives them home. But on the way home, they get into a fight. And apparently, the arguing is so bad that they stop in the lane of traffic um, and some. Uh, not far from their home, and some neighbors call the cops because the yelling is so bad. The cops come. Uh, eventually, he gets out of the vehicle. They take him down to the, the station. Um, they give him initial breathalyzer test, which shows he's way over the limit, uh, over 0.13. And um, key and fact, he was he was in the driver's seat when the police That's arrived. right. Yes. Yeah. So he wasn't driving, but then after they stop and argue, he actually is in the driver's seat, which whether that should be enough for a DUI, you know, is a different question, but that uh, the driver, the <laughs> police did not like that when they showed up. So that's why they bring, that's right. That's why they bring him downtown. So, well, and the, uh, the fact that his, just as an, I mean, the, the fact that the son was driving, I assume that's accepted because, because this is on like a motion or a summary judgment, I guess. But I, I wonder how we know that is what I'm getting at here. I mean, is it is that, that the really son was undisputed? driving before? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think there's testimony from from the children. Okay. So maybe that was and that was un, you know I, I, they probably was no counter witness to that. So yeah, so that's undisputed. I think there'd be some credibility questions there, but okay, <laughs> we'll we'll just accept that. I you know I'm guessing the argument might have been <laughs> about whether Mr. Miranda could take the wheel. I have I have no idea, but it could be. So he's down at the station and um that the implied consent law comes up. So I think just about every state has this. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and it is that when you get a driver's license, the state says you have, in, you have implied consent that if the police stop you, you will consent to a blood alcohol test when they're uh, looking to see if someone is drinking and driving. Um, and so they don't need your actual consent. Now, if you refuse, um, the Supreme Court has said to get a blood alcohol test that they need to get a warrant. But even separately from that, if you refuse, they can take your license away because it's essentially the same thing as a DUI um, by, uh, by uh, saying you won't submit to the test. Now, he does submit to the breath test, which, uh, by the way, the Supreme Court has said you don't need a warrant to get um, and so they want to get a blood test also. They have him downtown at the, um, or I say downtown, they have him at the station. He's in this holding pen and he refuses to give a blood test. And they ask him three times and he refuses each time. And, and that's what the Arizona law requires before um, he can be deemed to have refused the test. Um, so then they still want to get a, a, a blood test, even though they already have this, this, uh, uh, breath test. And so they're getting the, the warrant paperwork together to do this, which they then are going to do by telephone, which shows how easy sometimes it is for police to get a warrant and how a lot of this, these cases about um, how they can have a warrantless search or a warrantless seizure are sometimes beside the point. So they're, but they're getting the paperwork together to get a warrant. Um, and then uh, another officer goes into the holding pen and he says, I'll do the blood work to this officer. And he's like, oh, really? And he says, yeah, tell him I'll do the blood work. So it go, the, this officer goes back to the main officer, Officer Rush, who's getting the warrant together. And he says, um, he wants to communicate that 
uh, he's now ready to do the blood work. So he says, he says he's doing blood work. And then the officer rush says, he says he's doing blood work. And then this first officer says, yes. So then officer rush responds. Oh, no shit. Yep. Said the other officer. What does that mean? I'm not really sure, but that was in the record. But then they go forward and get the warrant anyway. And then they go and it says he kind of resisted, but uh, eventually they got the blood work done. So blood work, of course, comes back that he was drunk. So he's he's then prosecuted. Um, and, and, and at some point, by the way, he works for this uh, Customs and Border Patrol. He's an <laughs> officer for the Customs and Border Patrol. And he calls a buddy of his at CBP to come pick him up. I think he thinks he can get a jet, get out of jail free card by being CBP. Um, but uh, th- I guess that doesn't get him out of the blood test. But then what happens is he's prosecuted for a DUI, which he pleads out of, but then he doesn't actually do the plea and he's never even convicted for anything. But CBP um, then suspends him from his job because he does get his license suspended um, for refusing the the test. And that meant he doesn't have a driver's license, so he can't do a CBP job. So he's demoted and loses some salary because of that. So um, meanwhile, he goes to the administrative state administrative process to try to challenge the license revocation. That's really the only thing that happens to him in the end is the license revocation. Um, The first time this comes up, the off- this officer, Officer Rush, testifies that, yes, he um, did not submit to a blood test. And they ask him, did he ever change his mind? He says, no, he submitted to the blood test. But then Customs and Border Patrol is doing an investigation into what happened. And they get the video of this holding pen where, um, where Mr. Miranda was being held. And he, he claims he has no memory of basically what happened that night. So um, this, the, the, him saying, I, I don't consent, and then later saying, I'll do the blood work, has no memory of any of it. But the video shows him saying, tell him I'll do the blood work. So he loses the first time he tries to get his license back, but then somehow he's able to do a second administrative hearing, and there he introduces this video. Um, and based on the video, the administrative law judge says, Okay, yeah, I guess he did, you know, uh, consent to the blood work after all, um, even though he had he had first denied it three times, and uh, and even though he kind of resisted when they actually got the blood, uh, and so you can have your license. So it's unclear how long he was out of the license, but there was a period of time where he didn't have his license, and he um, uh, he he had a, a de- uh, he lost some salary, and a few other things happened to him. So. Um, the office, the, the ALJ does not say that the officer lied the first time when he said he didn't, uh, relent. And it seems like from the facts that this officer rush didn't really take this seriously when he said, I'll do the blood work, you know, oh, no shit. Um, and whether that, whether he actually lied or just, you know, tr- was, was reasonable and not taking him seriously, uh, that's not really solved by the administrative law judge. So creatively now, Mr. Miranda goes to court, to federal court, with a Section 1983 case and says that the the line on the stand by the officer in the first proceeding violated his due process rights because he didn't get his license back at that point. And I'm guessing what probably he was going for was there was a a loss in pay because he didn't have a driver's license. And so the um, the period of time where he didn't have the license, at least between the first hearing and the second hearing, um, he's he he should be uh, he should be due. Now, how the court solves this, like, I think, uh, given the facts, there's a the 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 city has a very good case here that um, the officer didn't lie. I mean, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Um, Might have just forgotten. I, you know. Yeah, or just didn't take him seriously. Who yeah. knows? And, and had reasonable grounds not to take him seriously. But instead of going into that, the court does kind of like the case we were just talking about, tries to avoid the issue and says that, well, um, 
even if the officer had lied, your remedy was to go through the state process and get your license back. And so you don't have a complaint here. Um, there's some case law we don't really need to go into. Um, there's an unhelpful Supreme Court case for him and some contradictory Ninth Circuit case law. But basically, at the end of the day, in a procedural due process case, if the state gives you a mechanism to you know, right the wrong and you right the wrong, you can't then go to federal court um, about that because you've already gotten the process that's due. And I guess my, my critique of that is, he, he definitely got his license back and he didn't have to sue about in federal court about his license. Um, but he did, even if it was maybe in the grand scheme of things, not that big a deal. It seems like he had a, a few weeks, a few months of uh, of lost salary and he had, you know, whatever came along with, with that. Um, and so there's there's some kind of cause of action there. Now, at the same time, he's super lucky he doesn't have a DUI on his record and I'm sure there's other things that would have happened with his job if he got that, uh, or one likes the hope. Um, but as a customs and border patrol officer, but uh, on the face of it, he he is he is out um, something for an arguable violation of his constitutional rights, and the court won't hear that claim, and that there seems something wrong there. And I think it, it, it's as I said at the beginning, it's an example of. Bad facts, very unsympathetic facts for this guy um, making some more bad law. Yeah, I mean, this guy is not at all sympathetic, right? And like the fact that he's like trying to use his status as a federal officer to get out of a DUI <laughs> and like, and even the fact that like this only this whole thing only comes out because the CBP for some reason is investigating the circumstances of this guy's DUI, which like maybe they have an interest in that and like to discipline him or something like that. Although even the ninth circuit seems to be a little uncertain of that. So like, you know, if you or I were to get a DUI, it's not like our employer would get to subpoena confidential documents from the law enforcement to then like get us out of hot water. Um, so, you know, yeah, none of it is particularly sympathetic, but at the same time, you're right. I mean, how imagine a different case, right? Where somebody, lost their driver's license because the police officer did just blatantly lie and make stuff up. Um, you know, maybe they weren't actually driving under the influence and the police officer just lied and said that they pulled them over after they were swerving and gave them a breathalyzer. Right. That it's just a complete fabrication because they maybe they don't like somebody or something like that. I mean, the this opinion would suggest you have no cause of action for that, that you're just out of luck. And that's, that just seems wrong. Like that can't be right. Yeah. And it, the, 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 well, the opinion just seems to suggest that well, the driver's license isn't, they say, well, maybe if you were like put in jail or, you know, something more serious, but a driver's license just isn't that important almost. And that doesn't seem right either because you're right. Your ability to drive is so, is so important for people. Of course, I mean it's so connected to to uh, earning a living for so many people, including including Mr. Miranda. Um, so we hope this uh, I hope this does not metastasize into uh, into other cases like that. But of course, I would not be at all surprised uh, if it did. Yeah, well, it's always you know that's always the danger, right? And it it's so easy for courts just to say, oh well, you know, um, if something it, it, it's bad facts, and so we just want to kind of duck the whole question and then they they issue these sort of categorical opinions and then you see down the line absolutely it, it'll have you know in the exact fact scenario i laid out maybe not who knows but i i guarantee you this will be cited in some awful opinion that we'll be talking about <laughs> at some point in the future <laughs> Well, we'll be on the lookout for that uh, awful opinion on short circuit, and uh, and and hopefully we can bring it to you. Uh, maybe a good opinion, who knows? Um, but I think that concludes the uh, Rob and Anthony show for uh, this week. Uh, short circuit for this week. So thank you, Rob, for coming on after the list of of thirty other lawyers. Uh, I'm glad at least you could make it. Um, squeeze us in. Uh, squeeze us in here. Uh, to all of you, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, stay tuned for our special episode next time in uh, we're up in a couple weeks. And in the meantime, I hope that all of you get engaged. 